This morning we're going to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, and I'm going to read verses 14 to 29. The Gospel tells us, And King Herod heard of him, and that is Jesus, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works to show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias or Elijah, and others said that is a prophet or is one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy man, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, and when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when the disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse, and laid it in a tomb. This is God's word for us, his people today, and we are grateful to God for his word. I had an appointment with a new doctor. And I had to complete all of those forms that you have to fill out before you can ever get to the examination room to see the doctor. One of the forms was the medical history. There were all of those questions about illnesses and medical conditions that you and your family members may have. There were also questions like, how much do you exercise? Or do you smoke? And then there was the question, do you have stress, followed by a list of places for you to check off. Do you have stress at work? Do you have stress at home? Do you have stress at other? And there was a blank to identify the other. The question wasn't, do you have stress, yes or no? The question was about where you have the most stress. The question just assumed that everybody has stress. And that sounds about right. Everybody faces pressure in this life because we live in a world of pressure. There's time pressure and financial pressure and work pressure and maybe most of all people pressure, that pressure that comes from our interactions and relationships with other people. Everybody deals with stress and I think we'd all agree that that's not up for debate. But what we need to know is to how to deal with stress, most of all that people pressure that we face. And maybe this story that we've just read in the Gospel of Mark can help us. It's been noted that this story can be read as a case study in pressure. 
And so maybe it has some insights for us in the dynamics of people pressure as it works itself out in our lives, and even more how we go about dealing with this kind of pressure that we face. First, there's some background. The King Herod in this story is not the King Herod that we read about in the Christmas story. This King Herod is King Herod Antipas. King Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great, as he was called, who was in power during the time that Jesus was born. This King Herod, King Herod Antipas, was the ruler in Galilee during the time in which Jesus was involved in his earthly ministry. And when people heard about everything that Jesus was doing in Galilee, they wondered, in effect, who is this guy? Some people thought that he had to be John the Baptist, who's been raised from the dead. Some people thought that he must be the prophet Elijah who had reappeared. Some people were more generic about it, and they said that Jesus was a prophet, just like the other prophets in the history of Israel. When King Herod Antipas heard about all the activities of Jesus in Galilee, he aligned himself with that John the Baptist school of thought. He was convinced that Jesus was John the Baptist brought back to life. And that thought must have caused all kinds of alarming flashbacks for Herod Antipas. Because I suspect that his memories of John the Baptist haunted him. Herod Antipas had two half-brothers named Philip and Aristobulus. They all three had the same father, King Herod the Great, but they each had a different mother. Now, if we can keep all of this straight, Brother Philip married a woman named Herodias, who was the daughter of Brother Aristobulus, which made her his niece. Then Brother Herod Antipas had an affair with Herodias, who was his sister-in-law and also his niece. Have you ever heard the song, I'm My Own Grandpa? <laughs> this family tree is almost that kind of confusing. Anyway, Herod Antipas, and Herodias ended up divorcing their spouses, and they got married to each other. Today, somebody would make a movie out of this story of the Herod clan. Well, John the Baptist was on the scene in Galilee during all this uh, time that this was taking place. And John the Baptist told things just like they were. And John the Baptist told Herod Antipas and Herodias that what they had done was wrong. And Herodias decided that she didn't like John the Baptist very much. In fact, she wanted to get rid of him. But Herod Antipas didn't want to kill John the Baptist. John the Baptist held some kind of strange fascination for Herod Antipas. Whenever Herod Antipas heard John the Baptist preach, something stirred within him. He wasn't willing to change his ways, but he wanted to keep John the Baptist around. He wanted to keep on listening to what John the Baptist was talking about. And so he didn't have John the Baptist killed. But in order to appease his wife Herodias, he did have John the Baptist arrested and thrown into prison. Well, then the fateful day came for everybody involved. It was the birthday of Herod Antipas. And he threw a big party for himself. And everybody who was anybody in his administration was there at the party. 
And the time was passing. It was getting late. And the wine had been flowing all night. And then it was time for the dancing. And Herodias saw her opportunity. She sent her daughter out to dance for the king instead of some of the professional ladies of the evening. Other historical records tell us that this young woman was named Salome. And Salome did something of a striptease. And Herod got all worked up and he called out to Salome, whatever you want, I'll give it to you, even half of my kingdom. And Salome wanted to talk things over with her mother before she made a request, and Herodias knew exactly what she wanted. Her scheme was working out exactly like she had planned. Herodias told Salome to ask for the head of John the Baptist. Salome was to ask for John the Baptist to be killed. Salome went back into the banquet hall where the party was taking place, and she said to the king, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, king Herod was shaken up with regret, but he had made that vow to Salome, and he didn't want to be humiliated by breaking his promise in front of all of his guests. And so John the Baptist lost his head. He was executed. Really, he was murdered because King Herod Antipas had lost his head and his heart and his soul. There was pressure all around in this story. That's why it's like a laboratory for us in the dynamics of pressure that come from our dealings, our connections with other people. We can begin with Herodias. She was the type of person who generates pressure on other people. There are some people who create pressure in a situation and they do it by heavy-handed displays of power. There are some people who create pressure more subtly. But however it is, the bottom line is that for everybody who puts pressure on somebody else, it all boils down to the same motivation. They want what they want, and they want what they want in their own way. Somebody has come up with a personal inventory of some questions that we can ask ourselves to see the extent to which we may put pressure on somebody else. Number one, in trying to get what I desire, do I ever withhold my affection or my approval or my affirmation until a person has done what I want them to do. Number two, do I ever create in people the fear of my retaliation or rejection in order to try to keep them in line? Number three, do I ever harangue somebody by constantly repeating my wishes even long after they have heard me and know exactly what I want? Number four, do I try to motivate people in genuine ways, or do I actually try to manipulate them? Number five, do I really believe the people in my life are capable of discerning what is right and then doing it? Or do I think I've got to control what people decide and do? Number six, do I feel a responsibility to straighten people out, to get them to do what I think they need to do? Number seven, can I state the truth as I see it and then leave it there? Or do I always have to have the last word on something? People who create pressure are exposed by these questions. Herodias would have been. And maybe in places we might be too. And then there's Salome, the daughter of Herodias. Salome was really a pawn in this game of pressure that was being played out that night. 
far as we can tell, Salome didn't have any personal reason to hate John the Baptist or her stepfather, King Herod Antipas. She asked for the head of John the Baptist because that's what Herodias told her to ask for. Herodias used Salome to get her own way. And it's possible that we may try to use other people to get what we want. In one church I served as pastor, in the church membership, there was a man who was in management in the electric power company in our area. And there was another man who was in management in the natural gas company. There was this fella who was seeking a job with a public utility company who began to come to our church. He very quickly got involved in the activities of the church, especially the activities attended by these two men in public utility management. This fella invested a whole lot of time and effort in getting to be known by other folks in the church. Well, the way it turned out, this fella didn't end up getting hired by the electric power company or the natural gas company. And we didn't see him at church anymore. He had been attempting to use a connection with these two men to land a job. And when he didn't secure the employment that he wanted, he quit attending our church. He revealed that his motivation for coming to our church apparently wasn't an interest in our church. It was an interest in what these two men might be able to do for him. Maybe there have been times when we have appeared to be friendly with somebody because of what we think they can do for us. Maybe sometimes we paid attention to this person in order to spite that person. Maybe sometimes we have praised this person in order to get some kind of reaction out of that person. There are a lot of ways that we can try to use people to get what we want. And when we do, the deepest problem is that we're treating somebody as a thing and not as a real person. Just like Herodias did with Salome, we may create pawns of pressure. And there's a warning in all of this. People who try to use somebody else may one day find out that they're being used by somebody else. That's just the way this game of pressure can work itself out. And next we can focus on King Herod Antipas himself. Herod created some of the pressure himself that he was dealing with. Herod didn't really want to kill John the Baptist, but Herod didn't want to refuse this vow that he had made to Salome. We're told it was because of the oaths that he had made and because of those guests who were sitting around the table with him. You know, it's possible that sometimes the promises that we make can get us in trouble. In a moment of emotion and haste, we may make a vow to do something or not to do something. And then we find ourselves under some kind of pressure that we haven't anticipated or the pressure of something that's unrealistic or unwise. Have you ever said, I'm never going to do that? And then you wish that you could do that. But out of pride and stubbornness, you just won't change your mind. Have you ever said, I'm never going to speak to them again? But then you're miserable until you break that promise and you begin talking again and your differences are patched up. I remember a time when I was young that my family was going out to eat. I didn't like the restaurant that my parents had chosen. And I loudly expressed my opinion. 
If we went to that restaurant, I wasn't going to eat there. I was just going to sit in the car. And my parents said, well, you can do whatever you want to do. And we got to that restaurant, and I sat in the car. And I looked and watched as other people came out of the restaurant and they looked like they had enjoyed their meals that they had eaten in that restaurant. And I was getting hungrier and hungrier. But there was no way that I was going to back down from what I said. And so I just kept sitting in that car. And I went home hungry. Have you ever done something like that? We blurt out some emotional, some not so well thought out declaration and then we're determined that we're going to stick by it no matter how silly or how irrational or how harmful it might be. And this kind of vow, this kind of promise turns up the gauge of pressure in our lives. There was another dynamic of pressure that was at work in all of Herod's mess. Herod didn't refuse that request that Salome had made because he had made a vow. And all those guests were sitting there. And somebody among those guests could have spoken up and told Herod Antipas that he didn't have to keep his promise. It would be okay if he didn't act on that request that Salome had made and he spared John the Baptist's life. Somebody could have called Herod Antipas back to his senses and helped him to get out from under the pressure of that situation. But they didn't do it. They just kept sitting there adding pressure to the situation watching this whole tragedy play itself out. Maybe sometimes like these guests, we may add to the pressure of somebody else because we're just staying silent. But there's something else about King Herod and these guests. In this story, they're just mostly there. No dialogue takes place. None of the guests is identified by name. They're just there. And really, that is their role in the story. These guests are the they in the story. And I imagine that we know only too well about the they, don't we? The they is that undefined collection of people out there who can make such a great difference in our lives. What will they think? What will they say? We know how it goes. Herod Antipas was torn up about the fix that he was in. But he didn't want to break that vow that he had made because he was concerned about what they would think if he went back on his word. He didn't want to appear to be indecisive. He wanted their approval, their respect. He wanted to be popular. And so King Herod Antipas ignored all of his deepest desires, and he had John the Baptist beheaded. There are some people who spend their whole lives making their decisions based on what other people think. There are politicians who don't vote their conscience, but they vote what the polls say. There are students who just become a part of the crowd. There are business people who do whatever it thinks, even bending rules and not being very ethical in order to impress somebody to climb up the corporate ladder. We may know only too well about the influence of somebody in our lives. And whenever the primary question that may come to our minds is this, what will they think? Then we're creating pressure for ourselves under which we're going to live. 
That's a recap of this sad story. The sad story of Herod Antipas and Herodias and Salome and all of the guests. This sad story illustrates for us the fact that life is full of pressure. People pressure of all kinds. But we know that life has pressure, don't we? What we especially need to know is how to live in a world of pressure. And there are certainly some destructive ways to deal with pressure. Ways that can hurt us and hurt other people and hurt other things. Elton Trueblood was a noted author and philosopher and theologian who was a member of the nonviolent people called the Quakers. He told a story about a Quaker farmer who had a mule that was extremely stubborn. Whenever this farmer wanted to plow, the mule wouldn't move. The mule just stood there. And this Quaker farmer tried every peaceful way that he knew to handle this mule, but nothing worked. And finally, with all the pressure mounting, the patience of this farmer was at its end. And he said to the mule without raising his voice, Mule, thou knowest that because of my religion, I cannot beat thee, nor can I curse thee, nor can I abuse thee in any way. But, mule, what thou dost not know is this, I can sell thee to a Baptist. <laughs> now, I suppose this is one way to deal with pressure if you're not a Baptist. <laughs> But we Baptists, and indeed all Christians, need to deal with our pressure constructively and maturely and responsibly. We need to live in a Christian manner with our pressure, and there's very one definite way to do this. We look to the one who we claim is the Lord of our lives. We look to Jesus Christ. Now imagine that this might be the answer that we would have expected. Jesus Christ, the Lord of our lives, is the one who gives us all of the resources for living with the challenges and difficulties that we face in life every day. And this is true for the pressure that impinges on our lives, particularly that pressure that involves other people. But there's a fundamental reason that looking to Jesus helps us to deal with our pressure. Pressure happens because there are all sorts of forces, all sorts of uh, things, people out there that are trying to shape our lives. That's especially true about other people. We live in a world where things are trying to influence us, shape us, mold our lives. But Jesus Christ is the one who needs to shape our lives, mold our lives, give direction to our lives. Because only Jesus knows what's best for us. Only Jesus has our ultimate and our eternal good in mind. Only Jesus can be trusted with our lives. And so when we look to Jesus to shape our lives, all of the other people, all of the other things, all of the other forces that would put pressure on us begin to shrink in importance and in impact. Living with the pressure that comes from our interactions and our relationships with other people really boils down to one issue. Whose influence needs to be the most important in my life? The influence of other people who may not have God's best for me in mind, they may not be concerned about what God's best is. Or is it the influence of Jesus Christ who is the proof that God loves me? The answer is really simple and clear. 
There's only one person ultimately that we need to answer to and please. There's only one person ultimately who is worthy of the devotion and the love of our lives and our following him as the Lord of our lives. And that's Jesus Christ. The way for us to live our lives in a world of pressure is to live our lives as people who belong completely to Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to ignore other people and the responsibilities we have toward other people. We're still going to be interested in knowing what the supervisor expects. We're still going to pay attention to the teacher. We're still going to listen to parents and spouses and other family members. But when we're looking to Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives, whatever may be happening in any other connections that we have, whatever may be happening in any human relationships that we have, we know that our relationship with Jesus Christ is always the most important relationship that we have. And our relationship with Jesus Christ transforms the way that we look at everything else, including that pressure that comes from other people. We know that what Jesus Christ thinks is most important and not what they think or even what we think. We know that Jesus Christ is the one to give shape and direction to our lives. Not anyone, not anything else. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor who was imprisoned in a Nazi war camp. His prison guards were always intrigued by him. They found him to be a man of uncommon vitality and serenity and courage. And he was this way even though he was under the tremendous pressure of the war camp. There was a key to all of this for Bonhoeffer. He did constantly struggle with being a prisoner, but he constantly knew where the source of his strength was. And he expressed it in this simple but profound prayer to the Lord. Whoever I am, I am thine. Lord, whoever I am, I am thine. No matter how much other people and things may be pressuring my life, Lord, I am yours. Lord, I belong to you. Lord, whoever I am, I am thine. This also needs to be the key for us as we seek to live faithfully in a world of pressure. Whenever we know that we belong to Jesus Christ, whenever we look to him to show us the purpose of our lives, whenever we look to him to give direction and shape to our lives, then we're able to deal with that pressure because we know that we belong to him. All of that pressure that comes at us from other people, it's not going to look as big and it's not going to feel as heavy when we're looking to Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives. And so here is the question for us that can liberate us and set us free from pressure in a world of pressure. The question is, Lord, what do you want? Lord, what do you want from me? What do you want of me? Lord, what do you want for me? Lord, what do you want? And we can be sure that what the Lord wants is always going to be what is best for us. So in a world of pressure, ask the question, Lord, what do you want? 
And then live out the answer. Live out His answer. Because we know that, Lord, whoever I am, I am thine. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful that we can make this prayer, that we are yours. We know that because you love us in Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we have that relationship with you that makes all the difference in the world. Father, every day, help us to look to you and to find your resources for living, that we might live with all the pressure that comes at us from so many directions and so many people. Help us to live faithfully to you and help us to live faithfully for you, for our lives are yours. And we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.